human tissue authorisation. Scotland Bill can invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to speak to and move the motion. Minister, please. Thank you. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to open this debate on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. Before going on to some of the specific elements of the bill, I think it's always important when we're talking about organ and tissue donation and transplantation to remind ourselves of the bigger picture. The transplantation of donated organs and tissues is one of the most incredible developments in modern healthcare. It reflects the best of humanity, responding to acute need with incredible generosity. And it's a testament to the wonders of the National Health Service, to the skills of our nurses, clinicians and surgeons, and to the organised efforts of everyone who works to make these life-changing gifts possible. In Scotland, we've seen tremendous progress over the last decade. Following our work to build and strengthen the system, and as a result of the incredible generosity of donors and families, we've seen a significant increase in the number of donors and in the number of organs and tissues transplanted. Transplants that have saved and improved lives. Transplants that have allowed people to live fuller lives, to be less dependent on a hospital visit and healthcare, and to get back to work and can contribute to society. For the transplant recipient, the gift they have received represents the opportunity to start life anew. But of course, not everyone receives the organs or tissues they need. While many lives have been saved and improved over the last decade as a result of the hard work that's been taking place to build the necessary infrastructure, too many people are still waiting for the organ transplant that could save their lives. Over, the, over 500 people in Scotland are waiting for an organ transplant at any one time. These are people who want to live their lives to the full, who want to work, contribute and support their families. I believe it's my job, I believe it's our job to make sure we're doing all we can to get as many of these people the transplant they need. There will always be an absolute limit on the number of people who can ever become donors in Scotland. Only around 1% of people die in circumstances where donation is possible. But if there are steps we can take to allow more of that 1% to donate, I hope that members will agree that it's important that we do so. The primary purpose of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill is to introduce a soft opt-out system of organ and tissue donation for deceased donors. The bill amends the existing Scottish legislation that supports donation, the 2006 Human Tissue Scotland Act, by introducing a new additional form of authorisation called deemed authorisation. In practice, this means that where a person was not known to have any objection to donation, donation may proceed. Deemed authorisation will apply to most adults from the age of 16 who have not otherwise explicitly opted in or opted out of donation. However, the bill contains safeguards to ensure that donation won't proceed if, there isn't, if that isn't what the person would have wanted. The bill also provides safeguards for those adults who lack the capacity to understand deemed authorisation and for adults resident in Scotland for less than 12 months who will not be subject to deemed authorisation. Evidence suggests that there is no one answer to increasing organ and tissue donation. And there's no silver bullet. However, there is evidence that opt-out systems can make a difference as part of a package along with other measures. Scotland has already taken forward many improvements. With our partners in the NHS, work has progressed over the last 10 years to improve the infrastructure and systems which support donation. This includes learning from other countries such as Spain, and responding to major reviews such as the Organ Donation Task Force report in 2008. Improvements have also been realised through the Scottish Donation and Transplantation Plan to 2020. Such, indeed. David Stewart. The member rightly identifies Spain as being top of the league table for organ donation, but the member, the minister will know that success there has been because they've had a high level of intensive care beds rather than about consent. Could the Minister answer that point? Minister. I think the point is that we should look to right across the world to learn lessons, but we do have to recognise that there are differences in systems. So while we look at other systems to see what we can adapt to our system, 
we need to be mindful of, of, of differences in culture and, and differences in, in the way forward. And so I was pleased that the, the, the committee in, in its review of evidence uh, agreed and, and specifically, I think, made that the point in relation to the differences from the Spanish system to the UK system. Improvements um, have also been realised through the Scottish Donation and Transplantation Plan to 2020, such as the appointment of a Scottish Regional Manager for Specialist Nurses for Organ Donation and the publication of um, Secondary Schools Education Pack, which has contributed to the highest awareness amongst young people. The work um, continues and, for example, I, we recently confirmed to NHSBT that we'll provide funding to support new technology to help improve the outcomes for patients receiving liver transplants and increase the proportion of livers that are suitable for transplantation. A duty on ministers in the 2006 Act to promote donation through regular publicity and awareness raising has resulted in Scotland having the highest proportion of its population on the NHS organ donor register of any of the UK countries at 52%. But as support and awareness for organ donation has grown in recent years, so has interest in a move to opt out. The Members' Bill introduced by Anne McTaggart in the last session was significant. Although the approach in that bill was not supported either by Parliament nor Government, but both Parliament and Government recognised that there was an appetite to move towards a different form of authorisation. The bill before us is the product of that appetite and of the great deal of work that we've undertaken over the last few years following those discussions. We've worked with a lot of people, including NHS professionals and people affected by donation and transplantation to consider how best to introduce a system of opt-out in a way that contains appropriate safeguards and in a way that will not compromise the already complex and lengthy donation pathway. We place a particular importance on making these changes in a way that is transparent and open to the public. Organ and tissue donation enjoys and depends on a high degree of public support and we don't want to do anything that puts that support at risk. I want to now turn to some of the specific sections of the bill. The bill sets out a framework for pre-death procedures. That's medical procedures which may be carried out for the purposes of transplantation. The sorts of medical procedures that we're talking about here are, for example, blood tests or urine samples to help ensure that donated organs are more likely to be transplanted successfully and that the donor's wishes can be fulfilled. The bill also sets out that the authorisation for some procedures can be deemed in certain circumstances and I was pleased that the committee accepts the proposals in the bill but I recognise that this is a complex area. I want to reassure members that this sort of clinical practice is not new and it's already an important part of the donation and transplantation pathway. We also recognise that clinical procedures will continue to change and we want to ensure that there is a clear framework in place. That, and that this will set out when pre-death procedures can be used and what safeguards must be in place to ensure future developments in clinical practice can be introduced where appropriate. And we agree with the committee that the use of such procedures should be kept under review. The bill provides that the procedures and proposed changes to these procedures will require consultation with the appropriate clinical bodies and the scrutiny of this parliament. As with the, with positions around opt-out, our approach is to be transparent and to maintain a high degree of trust in donation. The bill also includes a new duty to inquire. In practice, this ensures that the NHS understands the wishes of the donor before further steps are taken. The aim of the bill is to ensure that the interests and the views of the donor are safeguarded at all times, but also that there is a clear and effective mechanism in place for relatives and others who are entitled to provide information to exercise their rights. To meet these aims, whilst reflecting current good practice, the Bill includes a duty to make inquiries in respect of authorisation given by the donor or whether an opt-out decision is in place. For example, the Specialist Nurse for Organ Donation or the Tissue Donor Coordinator will undertake a check um, to the information held on the Organ Donor Register. Inquiries will also be made of the nearest relatives or other person of the most recent views of the donor or whether the donor falls into an accepted category. To be clear, as with the law as it currently stands, families do not have a right to overrule the wishes of a loved one, but they do have an important role to play to provide information on whether the donor has expressed any wish or whether they had changed their mind. Indeed.
Mike Rumbles. This bill would change the laws at hand at the moment. At the moment, it says that the relative can only provide knowledge of the intended wishes of the donor. But the bill in front of us says they have to provide evidence to a health worker that would convince a reasonable person. It's quite a different, quite a different level of, of bar that the, the relative has to jump over now. Minister. So the standard of evidence in respect of a, a donor's view um, was given a great deal of consideration during the bill's development. The view on those working in the system was that requiring written evidence was impractical as it, it's almost never provided. So that's why um, the bill, while the consultation I think did include reference to written evidence, the bill does not. Um, and, and these are discussions which take place with families um, and, and, and they're, they're, they're rarely written down. So I think we've, we've, we've got the, the, the level of um, evidence required at an appropriate level. Our, Morris Corrie. Um, we talk about families having maybe been consulted, but have you considered powers of attorney and deputies of the Court of Protection? Minister. The, the, the aim here is to um, make sure that we are identifying the views of the potential donor. Um, and so while that might be the family, and in many cases that will be the family, in some cases it, it may be somebody else. And, 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 I, and I, th I think that is part of the process. And that is part of the process that, that, that stands just now, um, is that the, 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 the specialist nurses um, make sure that they are speaking to the best possible person to, to, again, to identify the wishes of the donor. And I think it is really a crucial part of the legislation that um, that is our, our aim. So good public awareness will be crucial in, in, in achieving that aim of increasing uh, support for donation. So the bill builds on the support in the 2006 Act for ministers to support and raise awareness of donation um, by also introducing a requirement to raise awareness specifically around the new authorisation processes that this bill introduces. We need to ensure that the public um, are aware of the opt-out system and able to exercise their choice to opt out of donation and we encourage to tell their family. The, in addition to the duties in the 2006 Act and those in the bill, the Scottish Government is committed to a high profile raising awareness campaign during the 12 months lead up to the introduction of the opt-out system. Awareness activity will be designed to reach a wide range of people including hard to reach groups, minority groups and those with special needs. We also recognise the importance of raising awareness of young people as they approach the age of 16, so they are aware of the implications for them and we're exploring ways of achieving this. Presiding officer, a great deal of work has gone into developing this bill over the last 18 months. I'm grateful to the expertise, dedication and experience of the NHS clinicians, professional organisations and individuals who have helped shape the bill. I want to particularly acknowledge the Scottish Donation and Transplant Group which advises government on these matters. Our long-term aim is to increase donation and transplantation rates, and I hope that this bill will contribute to that. I welcome the committee's um, support for the general principles of the bill, and I thank them for their thorough and constructive consideration at stage one. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I move that the parliament agrees to the general principles of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And now call Lewis MacDonald on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee. Convener, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Lung transplant recipient Gillian Hollis gave the Health and Sport Committee a neat summary of the general principles of this bill. Tell us if you want to donate, tell us if you don't want to donate, and if you don't tell us anything, we'll presume you have authorised donation. She was one of several people with direct personal experience from whom we heard formally or informally, and who helped shape the committee's report on stage one of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. I would like to thank all who assisted with our scrutiny by responding to our call for views or to our survey or by giving oral evidence. And I would particularly like to thank those like Gillian Hollis who gave evidence from their own experience, including people who had benefited from donated organs, patients still waiting for a transplant and relatives who had authorised the donation of an organ from a deceased family member. I would also like to thank the clerks to the committee and the Parliament's external engagement and media teams. As with the current law on organ donation, the Human Tissue Scotland Act 2006 
The fundamental purpose of this bill is clearly to enable an increase in rates of organ donation in order to save lives. The evidence we heard at stage one was that donation rates have benefited from the changes to law and practice which followed the 2006 Act, but they have not yet ended the tragedy of people dying while on the waiting list for an organ transplant. Despite all the good work done since 2006, there are over 500 people waiting for a transplant at any one time in Scotland, and there are simply not enough organ donations to enable them all to survive. The 2006 Act boosted donor rates in Scotland to be the highest in the UK, as uh, the Minister said, uh, although we are now challenged by Wales since the passing of new legislation there in 2013. But in Scotland, around half the population uh, have opted in. But that is still not enough. And we know from survey work that 90% of Scots say that they would like their organs to be available for transplantation after death. That means up to 2 million people in Scotland would like to be organ donors but have not registered their wishes. This bill deems those who have expressed no view on the matter to be potential donors, bringing the share of the population who can donate closer to the proportion of the population who want to, although, of course, uh, within the terms that Joe Fitzpatrick laid out in opening, that uh, in, in practical terms, only 1% of deaths can be appropriate for transplantation. People need to be able to make an informed choice about opting in or opting out, and also to understand the implications of deemed authorization. The language around organ donation can be confusing, so we also need a robust and continual engagement strategy to explain what it all means. The committee were keen to learn from the experience of other countries. The legislation passed in Wales in 2013 introduced a system of deemed authorization similar to that now proposed here. An evaluation of the impact of the Welsh Act confirmed that the new law did not at first lead to a major increase in donor rates, but that that has begun to happen in the last year or so. The evidence is that increasing donation follows increasing awareness, not simply from a change of the law on its own. Likewise, as we have heard, the evidence from Spain did not prove a direct link between an opt-out system of deemed authorization and an increase in transplantation rates. High numbers of intensive care beds and of hospitals able to retrieve organs have been at least as important to the high organ donation rate in Spain, as David Stewart indeed pointed out already. So when we asked the minister to review the issue of intensive care beds, he indicated that the 2020 strategic forecast did not anticipate an increase in donation rates above increasing capacity as a result of the bill. We therefore recommended a review of infrastructure across the country for organ donation, and I therefore very much welcome the Minister's commitment today to discuss with st stakeholders whether further improvements can be made. The Committee's online survey on the bill attracted 747 responses. The most widely held concerns related to the rights of the individual who has not expressed a view but whose body could be treated as some felt as if in some way it belonged to the state. While we did recognize the ethical and legal issues raised, the committee accepted the minister's view that in the final analysis, the right to authorization rests with the donor, and by the same token, so does the right to withhold consent. The idea that deemed authorization could undermine the sense of a gift from donor to recipient was also highlighted in our survey. However, patients awaiting transplant, on the other hand, were insistent that any organ would be welcome as a gift, whether it was enabled by registration as a donor or by deemed authorization. Clearly, it would be useful for the Scottish Government uh, to revisit this uh, in a number of years, as Mr Fitzpatrick has indicated he in, uh, is intended uh, in his contribution this afternoon, to see if there is any change in public attitudes uh, and any impact on donor rates. We would also like to see a review after the same sort of period, perhaps five years, of the bill's provisions for medical procedures prior to death to help successful transplantation. Uh, the Minister again mentioned this. This is critical to ensure that such procedures are conducted with the necessary sensitivity. The committee had a very valuable session with the Specialist Nurses Organ Donation, or SNODs, who showed us how they work with the families of potential donors. It became clear that families have a dual role in providing the essential medical and social history of the prospective donor and in enabling donation to go ahead. We were struck by the many and sometimes difficult questions which SNODs 
have to ask at what is already a distressing time. These questions are standardised across the UK in order to maximise the opportunities for donations and transplants between jurisdictions. We suggested that this would be a good time to review these, to ensure that every question asked continues to be one of clinical importance. And so we welcome the Minister's commitment to take this forward. The law already says that the wishes of the donor are paramount, rather than the views of family members. But as we heard in committee from uh, Dr. Stephen Cole, consultant in intensive care medicine at Nine Wells, doctors would find it difficult to override the wishes expressed by patient relatives. We accept that in practical terms, it would not be possible for the medical profession to proceed with donation against the wishes of the family. And therefore the role of SNODs in working with families is clearly critical. We heard from patients on the transplant waiting list who told us about the emotional and financial distress caused by waiting for an organ to become available. Even when an organ is found, 40% of transplants do not proceed for a variety of reasons. And this is really tough for those on waiting lists whose hopes can be dashed time and again. Now we know that specialist post-transplant support is provided to recipients of blood, stem cell, or bone marrow donations, and we see no reason for any difference in approach. So we'd welcome the assurance from government that psychological uh, support across all these services uh, being under review, including for people affected by organ donation. And having had that assurance from the minister, we look forward to the findings of that review later this year. For the bill to achieve its aim, to increase donation rates, a high profile public information campaign is required, running for at least 12 months before commencement of the new rules. We are pleased that the government has accepted our recommendations that they review the engagement strategy in Wales and undertake outreach sessions uh, with ethnic minority groups. We also welcome their commitment to build on the existing collaboration between the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the Anthony Nolan Trust, who work together to promote awareness of stem cell donation in secondary schools and colleges. So the committee supports the general principles of the bill, but we stress that the bill alone will not achieve the desired effect. Scotland, like Wales, must use the change in the law as a vehicle for promoting greater awareness of the benefits and requirements of organ donation, and ministers must therefore ensure that the necessary infrastructure is in place in good time to support the increased number of transplants that we all want to see in Scotland in the 2020s. Thank you very much. I call on Miles Briggs to open with the Conservatives, please, Mr Briggs. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, when I attended university in Aberdeen, all students at the time in the Granite City became very aware and concerned about our fellow student, Millie Forbes. Millie needed a vital bone marrow and stem cell transplant, and after significant work to try to find a donor, it had led to no suitable match. As a young man who had just escaped rural Perthshire for the city life of Aberdeen, I can say registering for any donation list was the last thing on my mind. But for so many students in Aberdeen, it was the need to do something and wanting to help that made student, the student population sign up en masse to the Anthony Nolan uh, register and to hopefully be the match that Millie needed and donate blood stem cells. Now, Millie sadly lost her fight um, aged just tw 21, surrounded by members of her family at the anchor unit at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary in 20, 2004 eight months after she'd successfully undergone a stem cell transplant operation, her only real hope of survival against a myeloid uh, leukemia. Millie was a real inspiration, and 15 years after she lost her life to leukemia, it's remarkable how Millie's campaign has brought fresh hope and saved lives of others with leukemia across Britain today and since. For me personally, it's this experience that's made me think about these issues and to decide during my time at university uh, to sign up to the Anthony Nolan Register and the Organ Donation Register. But sadly for so many of our fellow Scots, taking this step or even having a conversation with loved ones is just not something that is happening today and why so many people's wishes on organ donation are simply not known and not registered uh, or known by family members. And it's this that clearly needs to be improved in Scotland today. In Wales, the most recent figures since they changed organ donation uh, legislation showed that from November of 2018, the rate of family consent is now at its highest ever level at 80%. This compares with Scotland at 63%, England at 66%, and Northern Ireland at 66.7%. 
I'd like to thank all those organisations and groups who have provided briefings ahead of the debate today and for the contribution um, they have given to the work of the Health and Sport Committee. I'd like to also put on, my, uh, on record my thanks to the committee team and for the work which they've undertaken during the inquiry and also recognise the work of Mark Griffin in bringing forward um, his private members bill on this. In the time I have, though, I wanted to touch on some of the important aspects of the bill, um, which we need to get right as the bill progresses through Parliament. The wishes of the donor's family has already been uh, raised, and this is something which I think we need to make sure is at the heart of the bill. And throughout our inquiry, it was clear that the role of the donor family is fundamental to the success of any donation going forward and will be central to the success of this bill. Yes. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank the member for taking intervention? And just to clarify a point, is it uh, the member's view that the wishes of the donor's family should supersede those of the donor themselves? Miles Big. I think this is where we found difficulty, and specifically in the sense of if someone's um, not known uh, to have a wish expressed, then actually they already have that opportunity in not taking forward uh, the questionnaire, which still stays part of the bill. So in theory, that will still be the case if they're not willing to go forward with the donation questionnaire. And that's something which I know the SNOD team have always uh, found difficult. And during the inquiry, as, uh, when the member was a, still a member of the Health and Sport Committee, I think it was that work which was done with the specialist nurse for organ donation team which was so important. I have to say, personally listening to the conversations um, they take forward and facilitate with families at the most distressing time um, any of us can imagine is both incredibly professional and also demonstrates our NHS at its very best. The professional, professionalism of the SNOD team is critical and the sensitive assistance and support they provide to potential donor families and the open communication and transparency around this um, is also vital to the process. I'd like to pay tribute to the work they do in supporting families at this unimaginable time of distress and also um, the work which they are doing to actually highlight uh, the benefits and, and keep informed families um, post uh, organ donation. It was clear that families um, have always and always will be at the heart of facilitating donor selection through the donor uh, questionnaire process and in taking forward the wishes um, of a donor. And this was demonstrated by the conversations the committee, as Lewis MacDonald al already highlighted, had with families. I want to thank the families again who gave their time so generously to the work of the committee. And I think I speak for all members um, when I say that we learnt uh, much from them. For those families, though, who have decided not to go ahead with donation, it was understandable, and I hope that we've been able to take forward improvements on what they outlined had influenced their decision-making at the time and how we improve the organ dona donation system and the family experience further in the future. Family refusal accounts for 50% of non-donations. In countries where they've adopted a system of opt-out, this is now reduced to around 25%. There's clearly much work to be done to help improve family consent rates, and I believe the work we've done in this bill can help to very much improve that. I don't have time today to highlight the amazing work and lasting connections made through the Family Donor Network and other organisations, such, such as the British Transport, Transplant Games, um, but I also wanted, in terms of the work we undertook, to highlight the work of these organisations and thank them. Infrastructure, as already has been highlighted, is an issue which has been raised with the committee and which I believe we need to see significant commitments from ministers. Intensive care beds, as David Stewart's already outlined, are a key area which the committee had highlighted. It's clear if the bill is going to achieve the outcomes of increasing organ donation, then we'll need to see progress on improving trans transplantational infrastructure. Now, I welcome the minister's response to the committee, um, but I think it is also important that we see further clarity on capacity issues to support the bill in the future, especially around uh, staffing and intensive care beds. The useful briefing provided ahead of uh, the debate um, by the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh specifically makes key recommendations and points around this, which I think um, are important as we progress to stage two as well. Celebrating organ donation is something which I hope we will achieve within this bill. We need to change the culture in Scotland to be to public, uh, publicly uh, recognise and celebrate organ donation more and to see the life-saving and life-changing difference that donors and their families do for the majority of, in the majority of cases, total strangers and actually giving the gift of life. 
is incredible. The committee has recommended a communications programme, as outlined, and I believe if the bill passes, we need to make sure that this is one of the best and most innovative public information campaigns um, a Scottish Government has undertaken. Um, Deputy President Officer, to conclude, Scottish Conservatives welcome the publication of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill, and the debate today, I think, is very important as we move forward with the Bill in Parliament. We believe all options should be considered to increase organ donation, and we'll engage in the legislation progress before the final vote at Stage 3. The SNP Government also must ensure that the comprehensive information and adequate infrastructure which we will need is in place so donors and families are fully informed and organs which are donated are able to be transplanted successfully in the future. Presiding officer, someone in the UK dies every day waiting for an organ transplant. We have the opportunity, I believe, to change that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Briggs. And I call on Monica Lennon to open for Labour. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in this Stage 1 debate on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. And like other colleagues, uh, I also want to thank the Health and Sport Committee for its diligent work and reports ably summarised by the convener, Lewis Macdonald, just uh, a few minutes ago. And I'm grateful to the British Heart Foundation, the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, the Royal College of Nursing, the Anti Nolan Trust and Kidney Care UK for their briefings ahead of the debate. Scottish Labour supports the general principles of this bill and its overarching aim to increase the organ and tissue donation rate and consequently the number of transplants that can be carried out. Scottish Labour has long been supportive of a soft opt-out system and I would also like to thank my colleague Mark Griffin for his influence on this agenda through his Members Bill in 2016 and prior to this Anne McTaggart's work on her Members Bill in 2015 and I look forward to hearing from Mark Griffin and other colleagues this afternoon. With 500 people on the organ transplant list at any one time in Scotland and up to 60 people each year dying while on this list, there certainly is a need to increase the number of donated organs. So I'm pleased that there is public support for a soft opt-out system demonstrated in the Scottish Government's consultation and the committee survey. That said, I think we're all alive to some concerns that have been raised about the move to a soft opt-out. Some people expressed a worry that people have organs removed against their wishes. However, it is important to highlight that people can still opt in and opt out of the system as we have always been able to do so. For people who have not declared, consent would be presumed, but there are safeguards in place. For example, next of kin can provide information if this was known to be against their family's wishes. I'll take a brief intervention. Mike Rumble. As I said earlier to the minister, that is the law as it stands. The law stands now in the 2006 Act says they might provide knowledge of the deceased person's intent. But the bill in section seven actually says that they must provide evidence to a health worker that would convince a reasonable person. It's quite a different step change in providing evidence in legal terms. Monica Lennon. Thank you. Well, I've been reassured by the, the committee scrutiny and the reassurance that we've had from government that there are appropriate and robust safeguards. And I'll come on to talk about the public education aspect, which is so important. But fundamentally, it's crucial that we get these things right because people who are on the transport, transplant, forgive me, transplant waiting list urgently need help. Organ transplants do save lives and can make a transformational change to a person's quality of life. For example, Kidney Care UK described dialysis as distressing, extremely painful, and it can be hugely disruptive to daily life with five hour dialysis sessions three times a week. Challenging for people in, in rural areas, I'm sure Mike Rumbles knows that. So a kidney transplant can really give a person their life back. The committee heard that the wait for a transplant can be a lonely experience and it can take a huge toll on, on someone's mental health. It must be anxious waiting to find a suitable organ and then there's disappointment um, where delays and complications um, arise even on, on the day of surgery. Um, so returning to the transplant waiting list can be a source of disappointment and anxiety. While people are on the waiting list, I recognise the committee's recommendation to improve this experience for people where possible, uh, for example, by having specialists who are there to, to provide support. It is crucial that this bill is backed by clear and consistent messaging throughout Scotland so that people understand the system and crucially to spark conversations about organ donation. The BMA have said that whilst half of the population have opted into organ donation, 
their experience is that when asked, nine out of ten people say that they would donate their organs. So deemed consent will help to close this gap. And I hope we can all agree that a person desperately waiting on an organ transplant, which could be the difference between life and death, shouldn't miss out, simply because many of us never got round to opting in to be an organ donor. And the convener touched uh, briefly on the work of the Anthony Nolan Trust with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. That's an excellent partnership, um, especially working with young people um, in, in our schools. And since 2009, 13,000 people in Scotland um, have become, uh, have registered on the, on the stem cell donor um, register and potentially that saved 42 lives. So this is, this is fantastic work that I hope that the government can help these organisations to, to build on. Because the importance of public awareness and frank conversations is brought into sharp focus when we consider that family refusal results in the loss of around 100 donors in Scotland per year, which could make a huge difference to people on the transplant waiting lists. It might not be an easy conversation to have, and it might feel morbid to discuss it, but it is important we overcome this stigma and make our wishes known to our loved ones. I was moved by the stories from families where organ donation has been a positive experience and even helped them to come to terms with their loss. And just recently, um, I was walking our dog in Chatlerow Country Park in, in uh, Hamilton, and there's a bench that I've passed a number of times, but I knew this debate would be coming up, and it's a, it's a tribute to Lanarkshire's organ donors, and it's very poignant, and there's flowers, as you expect, and, and little plaques on the bench, but it simply says, um, to remember those who gave the gift of a lifetime. Um, so I'm pleased to hear about the measures currently in place for the families of the deceased where they get a certificate um, and that must be hugely important and, and meaningful because it is a very extraordinary gift. An additional benefit of good public awareness is that evidence suggests that it will help drive up donation rates. While the soft opt-out system is important, the BME and others have highlighted that a change in legislation is not a panacea and must be accompanied by investment in the infrastructure to support delivery and others have touched on that in terms of intensive care capacity um, and so on. In conclusion, presiding officer, Scottish Labour supports the general principles of this bill and look forward to working with others to bring forward amendments. Organ donation is one of the greatest gifts a person can give and it's life-changing to receive. It's important that this bill maintains a special nature in which it is viewed and surrounding measures must be implemented to help ensure its success. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call Alison Johnson, can I remind members, if you intervene, your request to speak button switched off, so check that you've switched it back on again. It's just the way this wonderful technology works in Parliament. And I'll call Alison Johnson, Ms Johnson, to open for the Greens, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too would like to thank the Health and Sport Committee, um, all involved in getting the, the, the bill to this point at stage one, the expert groups uh, and all who've been witnesses and given their time and I'd also like to note as well the contribution of Anne McTaggart and Mark Griffin in this ongoing debate. Um, right now about 4,300 people in Scotland are living with a donated organ because someone made the active choice to register as a potential donor. Thousands of people have a second chance at life and you know we're all aware of some of the heartfelt letters that recipients have sent to families of donors to get a sense of what this has meant to them. Scotland is doing well when it comes to getting people to register to be a donor. Around 50% of Scots are registered, as we've heard, compared to 38% across the UK. And as a result, the number of successful donors has increased significantly over the past decade, with waiting lists reduced by more than 100 in that same period. But as we know, that still isn't enough. 500 or so people in Scotland are on the waiting list for an organ transplant and sadly some 40 to 60 people will pass away while they're waiting and despite having that high proportion of people registered our level of, of donation here in Scotland is the lowest in the UK and that's why it's vital amongst other measures to increase the total number of potential donors and clearly there is scope to do that as there's a persistent gap between the number of people who state in surveys that they would wish to donate organs and the number who go on to join the organ donation register. And the question before us today is whether an opt-out system of any kind 
if, if the kind proposed in the Bill is likely to increase the number of organs that are available for donation. And the evidence on this, as we've heard, and as the policy memorandum rightly notes, is mixed. So we have to be very clear, and I, I think it, it seems across the Chamber that we are, that an opt-out system isn't an instant solution on its own. Some countries have experienced increased donation rates after adoption of such systems, and in some there have been decreases. But the evidence presented to the Health and Sport Committee, and in many of the briefings we've received, suggests that an opt-out deemed authorisation system as part of a broader strategy to increase donations may well have a positive impact. Figures released by the Welsh Government show a significant increase in families consenting to donation after the new system was established, standing at 80% compared to 63% in Scotland. An NHS blood and transplants audit of potential donors in 2016-17 showed that 177 families across the UK said no to donation because they were not sure whether their relative would have agreed. And based on last year's average number of 2.6 transplants for each deceased donor, those refusals could instead have led to around 460 life-saving or life-transforming transplants. If, as the Bill intends, the Scottish Government is able to reduce the high number of refusals by families in Scotland, then it will have a very positive impact indeed. The ideal, however, is clearly still to have as many people actively opting in as possible. Family consent is always highest where the person who has died opted in, and in that situation the intent of the person is the clearest. And that is one of the many reasons why Section 2 of the Bill is particularly important. It places a duty on ministers to promote awareness about how transplantation may be authorised. And it would be useful if the minister could give some more details on how that awareness will be raised um, when he has an opportunity in closing. Deemed authorisation really does depend significantly on people being well informed about their options. And so this awareness raising must continue over time. As we've heard, anyone resident in Scotland for more than 12 months can be subject to deemed authorisation. So the logical conclusion of that is that we must have a continual year-on-year -year campaign of raising awareness. NHS blood and transplant surveys show that more than 80% of people support organ donation, but only around 49% of people have ever talked about it. So we need to have a wider and more effective national conversation about organisation, about about organ donation and I'd be interested to hear from the Minister how he thinks that can best be achieved. Um, before closing, I'd like to focus on the role of specialist nurses for organ donation. The whole system really does hinge on the incredible work that the specialist nurses do. They lead the discussion about the patient's decision for donation with the family, where a decision to donate is established, the nurses ensure that the relevant medical tests are carried out and they discuss the patient's medical history with the family. The new system potentially changes quite significantly their role. For example, the new duty to inquire established by the bill will in practice likely lie with the specialist nurses and there will be, for example, retraining needs related to that. And the evaluation of the Welsh system has drawn attention to the pressure that some specialist nurses felt to make the policy work. Some nurses were concerned that they might be blamed if consent and donation rates didn't improve. So clearly that's something that we can learn from and something I'm sure we'll seek to avoid. It's also important the guidance for specialist nurses and other professionals is clear, particularly in relation to some of the challenging situations they might face, such as when the family objects, even though relatives have no formal entitlement to refuse a donation. As part of a broader strategy to increase donation rates, the bill is welcome. Clearly though, this is a sensitive issue and the bill will need to be implemented with care, appropriate safeguards and respect paid to the very difficult situations families face having lost a loved one. But if there's a chance that it could lead to more people getting the gift of life, it should be welcomed. Greens support the general principles of the bill and will vote accordingly at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Alec Cole Hamilton to open for the Liberal Democrats. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to stand here today to offer my full-throated support for this piece of legislation. 
When I was out losing elections as an aspirant Liberal Democrat candidate, I was often asked at hustings and party meetings, as I'm sure each of you were, if you make it to Parliament, what would be your private member's bill? It's a hypothetical question, but I always gave the same answer. And Deputy Presiding Officer, this bill was my answer. I always supported legislation to bring forward a soft opt-out system and presumed consent for organ donation, and I'll tell you why. When I was 14 years old, I met a guy called Anders Gibson. Anders was uh, 12 at the time, and uh, he and I soon became friends. And I was told uh, by adults around Anders that I had to be prepared for the fact that he might not see 20, and that was because Anders had um, CF, cystic fibrosis. Um, however, uh, happily enough, Anders rode the wave of medical advancement and uh, benefited from new treatments which emerged in his late teens. Um, and he went on to become a fierce campaigner for cystic fibrosis uh, issues, an ardent footballer and a brilliant stand-up comic. Very sadly, we lost Anders in 2014 in his mid-30s, but I speak in his memory today, and I am grateful for his impact on my life and the lives of everybody with cystic fibrosis in this country. It is for that reason I understand entirely the personal motivation behind Anne McTaggart and indeed Mark Griffin for both bringing private members' bills of that kind to this chamber. I thank them for the work. They have paved the way for change in this country that might not have happened uh, were it not for their efforts. And rightly so, because we are pushing on an open door here. We've heard that, the, that we have a, a very high rate of registration on the uh, organ donation register. And 70% of our fellow uh, country people do support change in this regard. But there is always a disconnect. It's been alluded to by several speakers who've spoken already between those who don't mind the idea of having their organs give life to others in the event of their passing and those who actually sign up uh, to the register. And we know the human cost of that disconnect because on any given day in Scotland there are 500 people waiting for an organ in this country, some of whom may wait in vain and ultimately pay the ultimate price to that. Um, and it may not be a huge uplift in the number of organs that are made available, but it is a vital step we need to take. It, it is important to recognise that if we um, bring in a, a soft out system, it doesn't mean that everybody's organs will automatically be donated at the event of their death. You need to die in very specific conditions for that to happen. But nevertheless, it will give hope to those 500 people where none existed previously. I'd also like to state at this point, if I may say so, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, we don't need to wait for people to die to benefit from organ donation. In the middle of next month, in mid-March, I'll be hosting a photo call after FMQs for Give a Kidney UK, which are a philanthropic organization of philanthropic organ donors who I think uh, don't have enough publicity and I urge you all to learn about them because they are truly heaven sent. Uh, this process around this bill has been a very enjoyable one. It's been touching and indeed inspiring and I want to pay tribute to the outstanding work of the specialists transplant nurses, they are a credit to their profession. I mean, they take, I had no idea about the pre-death procedures in advance of transplant, but they are onerous. There are hundreds of questions that have to be asked of families at the most vulnerable point in their journey through grief. Often prior to somebody, somebody's actual death, they have to take time away from the bedside to answer some of these questions. But these transplant nurses do it in a way which makes it a cathartic experience. It's almost, they, they get to unpack that person's life and their likes and their dislikes and, and who they were as a person. And it was really touching to see how they make a bureaucratic exercise intensely cathartic for the families around them. But it is vital that that process not become part of a barrier. And whilst I understand the duty to inquire, I do support um, the, the suggestion from my friend and colleague, Mike Rumbles, that we need to uh, have some amendment around the need for evidence that would reasonably convince a reasonable person in ascertaining the views. But nevertheless, uh, by retaining opt-in as well, I think that's important. We need to engender those conversations and make this continue to, to feel like a gift and to, to have a gift-giving element where people can 
proactively make that statement. And those who receive those organs do absolutely regard that as a gift. And again, one of the most touching moments of this consideration was when we had a, a breakfast session with uh, half a dozen recipients of organ uh, donations, and they were inspiring people. They talked of their gratitude and such goodwill they exhibited to their donors and particularly uh, felt the, the impact of their, that gift on their life. Um, it is so important to recognize, though, that th those, each of those people have been through a roller coaster of emotions on that journey. And I think we need to do something in the, in the sort of periphery around this bill to do more for them. Anders, who I mentioned at the start of my remarks, had four abortive attempts to go to Newcastle to get a lung transplant. Um, that had a profound effect on his mental health, waiting by the phone, being turned around and having to restart that whole process again. The guilt he felt of waiting for somebody to die. At the moment, we do nothing for people who are on that transplant register. And I really hope that the minister will address that in his remarks and agree to meet with me about how we can do more. But in essence, in, in its brass tacks, we ab I absolutely support the principles of this bill. It will give hope to those 500 people and it will do more to make sure that people like Anders have a fighting chance at survival. Thank you. Thank you very much. Open debate. I call Emma Harper to follow by Maurice Corey. Ms Harper, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to be speaking in today's debate on stage one of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill as Deputy Convener of the Health and Sport Committee. The committee took a large volume of evidence and I'd like to thank the clerks for their hard work and diligence and I, I want to thank all who provided evidence to the committee. This includes the healthcare professionals, including Leslie Logan and her team, who provided us with insight and their medical expertise so that we could be better informed about the whole process of organ and tissue retrieval and donation, as well as the transplant process. I'd also like to thank the organisations who provided briefings ahead of this stage one debate, as Monica Lennon has pointed out, and this includes the Anthony Nolan Trust, who currently support education with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And I know that they have previously worked with my colleague, Bill Kidd, MSP. As a former member of the trauma and liver transplant teams in Los Angeles, I was especially grateful to hear from the people who are waiting on an organ. The personal voices of recipients and people waiting for organs and tissues is vitally important in informing this debate as around 500 people in Scotland are waiting on a transplant at any given time. Presiding officer, the primary aim of this human tissue authorisation bill is to increase the organ and tissue donation rate. Organ transplant, organ transplant is a complicated process and it normally requires two teams of healthcare professionals and two surgeries to engage and coordinate obtaining organ and then transplantation into a new recipient. I have participated in the process of retrieval of organs as well as the transplantation of solid organs into a recipient, a patient. And on one occasion, I even carried a heart in a sterile ice-filled bowl from one surgical team up three floors in the elevator to the waiting transplant team. It was awesome in the true sense of the word awesome. It was an awesome experience to be able to see the gift of one organ being transplanted into a recipient. The biggest challenge for me while working on this bill was deemed authorisation or presumed consent. One of the key arguments in favour of authorisation is that many people in Scotland support donation but have not yet recorded their wishes on the organ donor register. And we heard an evidence to the committee from Dr Sue Robertson, Deputy Chair of the British Medical Association in Scotland. Sue told us that about 50% of the Scottish population have already opted in, so they're already registered to be donors. And in the committee evidence that we heard, 68% of people in Scotland support being organ and tissue donors, but they have not registered, they've just not got round to it. And it is worth highlighting that when talking about donation, we're referring to heart, lungs, liver, pancreas, kidney, and even small bowel. And that's before we even start on tissue um, potential or tissue availability. Presiding officer, my own personal thoughts are that we really need to encourage people to make an informed choice on donation. We need to encourage families, friends, and colleagues to have conversations about donation. 
and if everyone has a conversation with their family members when they're meeting, they're chatting, they're engaged, this conversation is easier to have than at the most stressful, tragic, traumatic time when a family member is in the intensive care unit. And the specialist nurses who are having these difficult conversations with patients' relatives who have actually registered their wishes to donate, that, that actually puts the specialist nurses in organ transplantation. It puts them in a better position when they know what the wishes of the donor um, are stated. And so I would encourage that. For me, the conversation and education is the key. Um, I surveyed my own family and my team during this whole process of considering the evidence here at stage one. All of my family are on the organ donor register and my staff too. I was actually quite chuffed to hear that because no coercion was needed. And my dad, who's 77, proudly pulled out his organ donor card to show me his evidence. So he was absolutely happy to support people if his heart, liver, lungs, kidneys or pancreas or anything else, even his eyes, could save the life of someone or support their vision, someone whose life depended on this absolutely grateful gift of a person who, through some terrible, tragic or traumatic circumstances, would gift their organs and other tissue to save someone's lives. Donors could be called superheroes because they have the power to save so many lives. Heart, liver, lungs, kidneys, times two, pancreas again. So we can all be superheroes. So I'm on the donor register myself, so it'll be interesting to know how many other superheroes are in the chamber today. What is a bit disconcerting, though, is the conversation I had with my nephews. One's 14, one's 16, and neither have had any conversation with any educator about organ donation. And the Royal College of Physicians um, briefing suggests that this is particularly important in that we provide education in tandem. So, one of my big asks is to make sure that any education for the schools uh, and ethnic minorities is that we engage and we need to make sure that engagement is sustained as this bill progresses so that we can make sure that we can save lives in Scotland. Because for me, we need to make sure that we opt in, opt out and are able to provide deemed authorisation also to save lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Maurice Corrie. To be followed by Sandra White. Mr. Corrie, <coughs> please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is indeed my pleasure to speak on this bill in this debate today, and it's certainly a challenging subject, most certainly for all of us today. In the midst of grief over the loss of a loved one, organ donation is one of the most positive and life-changing acts that we can make. Playing a part in giving someone a second chance at life is a privilege. So with this in mind, any legislation that alters how this process works needs to be carefully considered and fully informative for those who it affects. We have seen the rise in the number of organ donations to Scotland over the last 10 years, and for those living in kidney failure or with congenital heart defect, we can only imagine what these donations mean for them and their families. It gives them a renewed outlook on what's possible, but as you have heard today, while organ donations may be increasing in Scotland, there are still many living in need of these transplants. The necessity of having more organ uh, donors on the register is clear, and over the past year, 27 people in the UK died while awaiting a heart transplant. This is where the proposed legislation seeks to bring about change, by creating three options, opt-in, opt-out, or deemed authorization. And this bill aims to encourage an all-important increase in organ donations in Scotland. And I must say, I'd like to thank John Mason e for his email, which I found very helpful with his Christian angle on this matter, and certainly was very thought-progressing, as I did spend a little time in church today before I came to this debate. Deemed authorization, in essence, presumed consent, has been successfully adopted by a number of countries. Indeed, of the top 10 countries in the world for organ donations, nine and organ donations, organ donation rates, nine have adopted a similar presumed consent model. So we see that in the right circumstances, this can work. And today, many people support organ donations, but often never get round to actually signing themselves up as donors, despite the best of intentions. Public support often doesn't translate into actual donations. Deemed authorization would help to tackle this problem, and for many, it gives the intended outcome that people may have supported, but not acted on in their lifetime. The third option of deemed authorization or presumed assent, uh, consent 
uh, also means that there is a higher chance of medical suitability. With a larger pool of potential donors, the likelihood of identifying a match is much greater. Of course, we all want to see a rise in organ donations, and so in principle, the objective of this bill is right and well meant. It has the potential to be effective in leading to a more successful donations. I am pleased to see that there will be safeguards surrounding this change. And for example, it is perfectly right that those under 16 who are incapable of understanding the uh, implications of deemed authorization will not be automatically opted in to organ donations upon their death. And for those who have been resident in Scotland for under a year, they too will be excluded from this pathway. Uh, these measures go some way to ensure that this is not a blanket change in legislation with no thought for, potential, for potentially sensitive cases. And having this soft, soft opt-in system solves the issue in cases where the wishes of a deceased person who, uh, were, not made, which were not made known before their death. In these circumstances and situations, it maximizes the use of potential donors. And however, while these three options, opt-in, opt-out, and uh, deemed authorization, may be the right step forward, changes the law alone will not work. The bill should not be implemented without proper investment in organ donation awareness, and there must be active engagement alongside this change in legislation. And first and foremost, I hope there will be engagement with families of deceased, and as I said earlier to the Minister, including the executors of deceased estates and those with powers of attorney and deputies in the Court of Protection. The way, the way in which families are approached and handled by organ do donor professionals in the hours after the death of a loved one is so important. A sensitive donor, the liaison team, can make all the difference to their experience. With generally exemplary training, these teams can help to guide their decision. And yet Scotland has the lowest family authorization rate in the whole of the UK. And for this reason, these proposed changes will not work unless families are consulted as part of the process. If loved ones are fully informed of what these changes mean, then the move is deemed, to deem uh, authorization will be a much smoother op transition. And I hope that this bill will be considerate and mindful of holding the rights of the deceased as well as the rights of the family. And the ethical, concern, the ethical concerns that can spring up from this balance need to be taken into proper consideration by the Scottish Government. And secondly, there must be engagement with the wider public. Surely, this can only be done with a strong emphasis on communication and awareness. And we cannot take it for granted how important it is to have public discussion on these changes on such a subject. Without, without it, how can we expect to see a noticeable rise in organ donation? Already, we have seen the benefits of the partnered visits conducted by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the Antony Nolan to Scottish secondary schools through visits such as these. Uh, teenagers have been equipped to understand what organ donation really means and how they can sign up. And awareness campaigns like this can, spark, uh, can be the spark that encourages families to talk about their issues. And I, uh, like Emma Harper, discussed only last night with my daughters and son on this very subject, and I asked them their views, and their views were very clearly the opt-in, opt-out approach. Uh, and I'm glad to say uh, half of them actually had donor cards, which I hadn't realized, and also one of them had the Anthony, was on the Anthony Nolan Register, which I commend that for. Uh, organ donation awareness um, and communication needs to be embedded at the root of our communities. And for this is how people can understand how they can choose to express their wishes and the implications that this can have for their families. And I need to add at this point, and the reason my children had that is because they had been t told about it at their secondary school. So it is working there, and that was in Argyll and Butte Council. Coordinating these efforts to make the process as efficiently handled as possible and with the utmost consideration is of everyone's interest. And even so, uh, I do agree with Mike Rumbles, as I too have concern about the written proof of the deceased's wishes be, uh, being necessary to support the family's wishes at such a difficult time. Although I am advised, essentially, that the questionnaire required is the safety mechanism that will be in place. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome this debate today, and we all want to see a rise in donation rates in Scotland, but for this to be possible, all sides must be listened to and taken into consideration. And if legislating a soft option approach uh, as a way forward, then the Scottish Government must ensure that it is done sensitively and with an effective and supportive infrastructure. You must and the proposed close, legislation, just finishing, just cannot stand alone. It needs to be connected with the increased awareness, communication, coordination. Thank you. Sandra White, please, followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you very much, President Officer. I also would like to take the opportunity to thank all the organisations, individuals, professionals who took part, took part in the evidence sessions, the meetings and surveys, which really you know, proved so invaluable to our report 
I also want to thank Mark Griffiths and the uh, previous MSP, Anne McTaggart, who introduced the Members' Bill in the last Parliament session. And although the Committee of the Time could not support the general principles of the Bill, I believe it has led the way to a much more comprehensive Bill that we're looking at at Stage 1. Uh, President Officer and others, I mean, I'll be perfectly honest here. Uh, having supported the previous Bill, I thought I had sort of learned a great deal about transplantation and organ donation. But I was very much wrong, uh, having heard evidence in regards to th this particular bill. I realised that this bill, the Human Tissue Authorisations Bill, was much more complicated and, yes, comprehensive than I thought. And when you read through the contents and some of the evidence that we took uh, for the bill, we looked at mandated choice, rights of the individual, gift element, authorisation process, rights of the family, their consent, post -trans transplant care, mental health and, and others as well. Huge list, very, very comprehensive. And that's why I felt as I was going through the committee, I was actually learning all the time. And one of the areas which I knew nothing about whatsoever, and I really took special attention to this particular one, was the pre-death procedures. I'd never heard of that before. And this is one of the areas that I would like to uh, concentrate uh, on presiding officer. Now, during the, the course of the evidence taking, as I said, I was really intrigued by the pre-death procedures and had asked various questions too. And uh, as I think it's already been mentioned by the convener, it's the 2006 Act. I think I'll take my glasses off. I don't seem to need them today. And uh, uh, lots of other things. I mean, many, many, you know, highlighted points in regards to it. And, you know, the bill, it creates two types of procedures, type A and B with further details which are contained in regulations. And it's anticipated that type A procedures would be more routine. I think the minister mentioned this in his opening remarks, blood and urine tests, and these would be allowed to proceed under deemed authorization or when the person has opted in. But then you've got type B procedures, and they're anticipated to be less routine, uh, including administration of medication or more invasive tests. And regulations could also specify what requirements would apply to type B procedures and how they would be authorised and deemed authorisation would not automatically apply to type B procedures. Now, I know everybody is intrigued with that. Now, I certainly was. And in the policy memorandum for the bill states, in all cases where pre-death procedures may be undertaken, a decision will have been taken that the person is likely to die imminently and that if the person is receiving life-sustaining treatment, this will be withdrawn. All very complicated, but all very necessary. And I, I found it really intriguing that these things were, were going forward. Now, during our informal meeting with the families who have authorised donation, we asked their opinion on pre-death procedures. And they did express their discomfort uh, of any invasive tests on relatives, but accepted the notion of blood tests and other routine tests. So it's really a very sensitive subject and very, very important. And we, we actually questioned uh, various experts, and one of the experts was Dr. Empson. And he confirmed that well, health professionals would not go through specifics with families for every blood test taken. Families would be involved with tests which help to certify death by neurological criteria, for example, to uh, observe brainstem death uh, taking place. And she ex explained basically when a potential donor is proceeding with donation, appropriate information, I think that may answer some questions that have already been asked, appropriate information is shared sensitively and compassionately with families. And certainly the families there did say to us, in fact, one uh, lady who gave evidence actually took part in understanding and seeing the process go through, very brave of her, but she felt it helped her in knowing that uh, her relative did not suffer at that particular time and they had donated their organs. So, I mean, it's, as I said, it's very, very complicated. There was other areas with, with pre-death procedures as well to do with the law and to do with doctors. Uh, the Law Society highlighted uh, one of the issues that uh, doctors should be concerned with prolonging life rather than viewing them as a source of organs, which I'm not saying that's a quote from some of the evidence that, that was given. Uh, and the Law Society mentioned the fact about the Hippocratic Oath uh, with the first consideration for health and well-being of the patient. This, this was raised in it. And obviously, I must uh, thank the minister as well. When he gave evidence to the committee, he re reiterated the need for transparency to maintain a high degree of trust in donation. 
Uh, I think it's really important, and uh, we ha I know the Minister has accepted the recommendation from the committee uh, that uh, steps to inform the families in pre-death procedures, accepting the proposal that we will look at the, the procedures be reviewed in five years' time. And I think that's really important because medical, you know, medical science moves on, so it might not be appropriate at that particular time. So I just wanted to, put, I'm, I'm very supportive of the bill, certainly we'll be supporting it, uh, basically, but I must thank everyone who gave evidence. A very comprehensive bill, and I certainly learned a lot during the passage of that bill. Thank you, presiding officer. Mark Griffin, followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, presiding officer. The Human Tissue Authorisation Bill is an important piece of legislation and the government has my support for bringing it forward. I had lodged a proposal for a member's bill to introduce the same system as the government intends and was grateful to the Health and Sport Committee for giving me permission to take that forward without any need for consultation given the extensive work already carried out. But uh, I did say at my appearance at committee that I would only take forward my proposal in the event of the government deciding not to, so I, I very much welcome this bill today. And at committee and in previous debates, I've spoken about my own very personal experience of the present organ donation system. And I'd like to talk about the huge impact increasing the number of organs available for transplant could have on the lives of those on the transplant waiting lists and on their families. Now, almost 12 years ago, a man received the phone call that he'd been waiting for um, for more than 10 years. He was told that a transplant heart was available and that he should come into hospital to prepare for his operation. He had taken ill 10 years before and had been struggling with the diagnosed heart condition ever since, with his health gradually deteriorating all the time, regular hospital admissions, losing the ability to work in his job as a welder, or to take part in any physical activity at all. That man and his family made the trip to the hospital and said their goodbyes that day, full of hope that the operation would lead to a much better quality of life. Unfortunately, that was not the case. After the operation, he was placed in intensive care as expected, but the hope for recovery just didn't happen. That wasn't as a result of a failing in the care he received from the NHS consultants who carried out the operation or the intensive care nurseries, uh, nurses who sat vigilantly by his bedside 24-7 during the recovery period. The reason he didn't recover was because his liver, kidneys and other organs failed as a result of having to wait, um, having to work harder in the previous 10 years to compensate for that heart condition. They just weren't strong enough to cope with the, the operation. A matter of days after the surgery, he died at the age of just 47, a young man given life expectancy in this country. He left behind a wife and a family of four children, two boys, two girls. The oldest was 22, and the youngest lost her dad at the age of 13. Today, he would have been 59, um, he's missed the, the university graduations and weddings of his children, significant birthdays, anniversaries, and the births of all his grandchildren. So many family members was missed and still to be missed. Now, of course, it's naive to expect everyone to survive a major operation such as a, a heart transplant, but it's common sense that for the person to be given the best chance of survival, they should have the operation as soon as possible after they've been placed on that transplant waiting list. And that's where this legislation becomes significant. If we can follow the lead of other countries around the world and implement a system of presumed consent alongside that high profile publicity ca um, campaign, um, I believe we can boost the number of organs that are available for transplant so that people will get access to operations sooner and we can help save lives. And I think if we remember that even just one more organ donor means so many more saved lives just by that um, one tragic um, incident. But I'd also like to pay tribute to the, the Evening Times, the British Heart Foundation and Anne McTaggart for the fantastic work they've done in working towards an opt-out system. Also the early adopters and drivers of this 
uh, policy in the government benches too. Kenny Gibson um, has been notable in his hard work in pushing for, for this change. But during the, the various campaigns, research has repeatedly shown, as others have said today, that although 90% of people are in favour of organ donation, just over half of the population are on the organ donation register. And I think if you're willing to receive a donated organ, then similarly you should be willing um, to donate. I think the, the only thing that prevented me from registering as a donor years ago was probably my unwillingness as a young man to confront my own mortality. And that's a silly reason when you think about it. And we could overcome that barrier by having a, a system of presumed consent. Now, presiding officer, some members will know who I was speaking about earlier. Others, most of you will probably have guessed that the reason I'd be able, able to speak so personally about organ donation is that the, the man I described as my dad, who uh, was lost to me, my mum, my brother and sisters at such a young age. And that's why I feel so strongly about this subject, why I support the bill, why I'm speaking today, and why I support the government wholeheartedly in their ambition to introduce a system of presumed consent in Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. Mike Rumbles, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've been on the organ donor register for the last 20 years. I was on the Health Committee when we passed the Human Tissue Act in 2006. And in the stage three debate on the bill, on that bill, I said, this bill is perhaps one of the best bills that the Scottish Parliament will ever pass. It is good news for the families who are waiting for a transplant for their loved ones. I hope that at a decision time, the bill will be passed unanimously. Well, it almost was, with the exception of four Scottish Socialist members, but I also noted in that debate that we had achieved more than 25% of people in Scotland on the organ donor register. And I see now, 13 years later, we have over 50% of the population of Scotland on the register. The 2006 Act has been a real success. I understand now that the Scottish Government wishes to go further. We now have a bill before us which changes opt-in to opt-out, in order to achieve even more successful organ donations. The committee in its report says, and I quote, the overarching aim of the bill is to increase the organ and tissue donation rate. I couldn't agree more with this aim. And that is what I want to concentrate on because I don't believe that as the bill is written in section seven, it will do this. The Minister for Public Health at the committee meeting on the 27th of November said, the current legislation and the proposed legislation are clear that the right to authorization rests with a potential donor. Unfortunately, that is not what the bill before us actually says in section seven. It says, the deemed authorization in section seven does not apply if a person provides evidence to a health worker that would convince a reasonable person that the adult was unwilling for the transplant to take place. Now, why have these words been used instead of the current wording of the legislation, which states that the nearest relative, and I quote, has actual knowledge that the adult was unwilling for any part of the adult's body to be used for transplantation? Now, there is a real difference between these two approaches. In the bill before us, the evidential bar for the family of the deceased to confirm the wishes of the deceased is being raised and raised unnecessarily. The family of the deceased now have to provide evidence that would convince about the wishes of the deceased. What sort of evidence that would convince does the new wording in the bill require? Well, it's silent on that. Now, I acknowledge that the public health minister has said that this bill doesn't change the fact that the right to donation rests with a potential donor. However, this right has to be a real right. And again, I focus on the problems the family would have in meeting the new evidential test about the wishes of the deceased if those wishes particularly had only been expressed to them in oral terms. In the summing up of the stage three debate in 2006, the then health minister, a certain Lewis MacDonald said, our new system of authorization, which is founded on honoring people's wishes, will mean that the person's own wishes are paramount. I couldn't agree with him more. And I continue to believe, and I hope Lewis MacDonald does also, 
that if we are to get the uptake in organ donations we need, we have to get the wording in this bill at section 7 right. The, uh, I will if I've got time, yeah. Keith Brown. I thank the member for taking, you know, try and be brief. I'm just trying to get a sense of whether the member is saying that the, as I think he just said, that the rights of the donor, somebody in full possession of their faculties has decided to donate, should be superseded by whatever evidential bar, by the family or not. It certainly, Mike Rumbles. it certainly shouldn't be superseded by the family, absolutely not. What we did in the 2006 Act was say that we have to have a system where the rights of the individual donor are paramount, and that's, that's the important thing. The reason why I'm so exercised about these words in Section 7 of the Bill is that if they remain in it, I am fearful that it could end up being counterproductive to what we all in this chamber want to see, an increase in organ donations. In 2006, all the members of the then Health Committee were concerned about the issues that had arisen at Alder Hayes Children's Hospital, the Bristol Royal Infirmary, uh, and other hospitals which I know the, the, the previous minister would acknowledge, which resulted in a loss of public trust. Indeed, we only have to look at more recent incidents, such as the Baby Ashes scandal, to see that public trust is a precious thing which we mustn't put at risk. Now, presiding officer, I want to vote for this bill. Let me make it absolutely clear. At decision time tonight, and I'm pleased to see that in paragraph 35 of the report, the Health Committee agrees with me, and I quote it, if the nearest relative, next of kin, or a long-standing friend is in possession of information regarding the deceased wishes on donation, it could be taken into account. That's marvelous. But the problem here is that this is not what the bill in Section 7 actually says. It replaces that wording about knowledge of the wishes of the deceased by replacing it with a requirement to write evidence that will convince a health worker of those wishes. Why this unnecessary change? If the minister in the summing up would confirm a willingness to return at stage two to the language used in the 2006 Act in section seven, then I'll happily vote for this bill. If the new words about evidence that will convince rather than the current words about knowledge are going to remain in the bill, then I believe this strikes out one of the fundamental principles of the bill. I am with the committee on this. They say in paragraph 10 of their report, deemed authorization would apply when someone dies without making the decision on donation known with their consent to donation being presumed unless their next of kin provided information to confirm that this was against their wishes. That is what the committee have said, and that's what I support. You must close, please. Knowledge is knowledge, and evidence is evidence. There's a clear difference. I would urge the minister to commit to using knowledge in the bill and not evidence. I want to vote for this bill, but I need to hear a commitment from the minister in his summing up whether he will... You Commit must close to please. looking at changing the wording in section 7 before I can vote for it at decision time. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And well, this may be a stage one debate. It's actually the culmination of decades of concerted campaigning by patients, medical professionals, third sector organisations, newspapers such as Glasgow Evening Times, and of course, many of my colleagues in the chamber today. And indeed, on 1st November uh, 2012, I myself led a members' debate on this very issue. I'm therefore delighted to contribute this afternoon and unequivocally support the principles of the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. And I would also like to recognise the excellent work that's been done by the Health and Sports Committee uh, and thank the British Heart Foundation in particular for their excellent briefing circulated to members uh, ahead of this afternoon's debate. It provided illuminating data on organ donation in Scotland and more importantly, acknowledged their dogged and proactive support for soft opt-out over many years. And we should of course remember the sterling work of Anne McTaggart in the last parliament and indeed uh, in this parliament, the, the work of Mark Griffin, who gave a very moving speech just a few uh, minutes ago. As we know, there's already been a significant shift in attitudes towards organ donation in Scotland over the years, and it's incredibly heartening that more than half of Scots are already registered to donate their organs uh, or tissue after death, with 50.4% of the Scottish population, far higher than the UK average of 38% registered donors. And this has yielded positive results with a 22% drop in people awaiting transplants between 2008 and 2018. However, sadly, I'm sure that many of us know someone who waited too long for an organ or indeed may still be waiting today. And indeed, we've heard of that uh, in this chamber uh, earlier this afternoon. At the end of 2018, 577 people in Scotland were waiting 
Any reduction, no matter how small in that number, will be life-saving and life-changing. Having campaigned on this issue over many years, I was delighted when the commitment to introducing a soft opt-out system was included in the SNP Government's 2017-18 programme for government. Indeed, we could have passed a Member's Bill to legislate on this issue last session. I voted for it. However, the majority of colleagues disagreed with me and deemed it not robust enough to prevent unintended negative consequences. The Scottish Government has fully consulted th on th with those working in donation and transplantation to ensure the proposed system will work not only in paper but in practice. The consultation show there's not, shows there is not only expert clinical backing for the bill, there is widespread public support for the principle of organ donation which needs to be translated into donor numbers as there is a clear gap between the number of people who state who would wish to donate organs and the number who join the organ donor register. By creating a soft opt-out system, we can more easily capture the estimated 80 to 90 per cent of Scots who support organ donation. Unfortunately, family authorisation for organ donation in Scotland at only 57 per cent is the lowest in the UK. As Dr Sue Robertson, Deputy Chair of the British Medical Association Scotland said, if you ask people, 9 in 10 will say that they would wish their organs to be donated. We are looking for that 40 per cent who have not opted in, but who actually want their organs to be donated. Those are the people who we want to have that conversation with their families because we know that they actually want their organi organs to be donated. And I heard earlier what was said by Alison Johnson in terms of um, specialist nurses, and I think that is very important. Of course, there's a so this is a soft opt-out system, meaning that it incorporates safeguards and conditions that might include seeking authorisation from the person's nearest relative for certain groups of people or in certain circumstances. This is not about the wishes of family overriding the wishes of donors. And as the Minister for Public Health, Sport and Wellbeing, Joe Fitzpatrick, clarified in relation to deemed authorisation, and I'm going to quote you here, uh, Mr Fitzpatrick, when the family are asked about donation, they will not be asked for their views. They will be asked about what they believe were the views of their deceased relative, who is the potential uh, donor. Uh, um, there is strong evidence to suggest that a soft opt-out system can improve levels of family authorisation with those living in countries with opt-out legislation between 27 and 56 per cent more likely to authorise donation of their relatives' organs. Uh, indeed, this has absolutely been the case in Wales where consent rates have risen by almost half from 49 per cent in 2014-15 to current levels of 72 per cent. Of course, medical suitability is key, with only 1% of people die in circumstances which leave their organs suitable for medical use. Unfortunately, we cannot legislate for medical suitability of organs and must concentrate our efforts on areas when we can make real change, increasing the number of potential donors and maximising family consent. In doing so, we will increase the pool from which medically suitable donors can be found and increase the likelihood of patients being matched and getting off waiting lists. It's also worth noting that this system very briefly, because I'm struggling for David time. Stewart. The, the members, thank a member for giving way. The member is quite right about the 1%, and uh, he's totally correct on that. We would not share my view if we increased the amount of intensive care beds, that would allow the medical circumstance so that more organs are available for transportation. Yes. I mean, I do actually Kenneth agree Gibson. with that, and I, and, I, and I listened to your speech with care early, uh, earlier on, Mr Stewart. Uh, I have to uh, say to you that this isn't a magic bullet and uh, other circumstances have to be taken into account. And, and indeed, uh, increased intensive care beds has been shown in places like Spain, I do think uh, actually make, make a difference. Um, Presiding officer, it is vital this legislation is accompanied by a coordinated campaign, as many members have stated, to raise public awareness and we have a concerted effort to make all diverse sections of Scottish society aware of their rights. This is also a key feature in the Health and Sports Committee's report into the bill, which re recommended a high-profile public information campaign, including outreach sessions to be held with minority groups and awareness uh, with, uh, with regard to children through appropriate methods, and Lewis MacDonald uh, covered that in great detail. I agree wholeheartedly with the recommendation and encourage the Scottish Government to take it forward. This bill is simply the latest step towards driving a long-term change in attitudes towards organ and tissue donation in Scotland, but is an important step and one I wish we could have made uh, many years ago. In supporting this bill, we are voting to increase the pool Please of close. viable organ, organs and improve and indeed save lives of people in Scotland waiting on an organ today. We are not stripping away individual choice, but empowering the majority of people who support organ donation who may not have had time Please or knowledge close. to form a register. In death, our body would normally give the world little, but in donation, our bodies can give life and happiness to others for many years to come. Okay, I'm going to have to cut the last two speeches. Uh, five and a half minutes, please. Tom Mason, followed by Keith Brown. The issue today 
before us today is one of un unmistakable importance. Organ donation is a life-saving procedure for thousands of people every year. As more than 500 people in Scotland are waiting for a transplant, we do need to find ways to increase the pool of available donors and speed up the process of donation for more people. With this in mind, I support the general principles of this bill and the incorporation of deemed authorisation into the current system. I believe that the proposals to create such a soft option system would be welcomed by the majority of people in Scotland. As consultations conducted by the Scottish Government, the Royal College of Nursing and the British Heart Foundation confirm. One of the fundamental reasons for bringing this legislation forward is to put in place a system that would increase the pool of donors and thus the chances of someone on the transplant list getting a suitable organ in a shorter period. The Health and Sports Committee consultation on this raised some concerns on the ability of the bill to deliver this. However, I also note that it is by no means an unanimous op opinion. I do think the bill should be given the chance to move forward, and if such concerns are addressed again, then measures should be intru introduced to make sure it achieves its stated goals. Another issue that I hope will be addressed at the future stages is the information available to wider public about organ donation programmes. The Royal College of Nursing has asked for a public awareness campaign of no less than a year before any changes come into effect. Whilst the Royal College of Physicians asked for a parallel process of public education about organ donation and the infrastructure available to support families. This, I think, is particularly important given that 80% of Scots support organ donation, only 52% have signed up to the organ donation register. Getting people to support donation is an important first step, but it is vital to capitalise on this support and make sure they put themselves forward and expand the number of potential donors. As the law study notes, donation proceedings against the wishes of the family concerned would be extremely difficult. Yet allowing families an effective veto over the previously expressed wishes of the potential donor would be contrary to the fundamental aims of the bill. The committee will have to consider how to balance these competing ideals at stage two in order to ensure that this legislation has legitimacy in the eyes of both families and the wider public. Presiding officer, we must never lose sight of the human side of this issue and why it is so important. In 2014, one of my constituents was taken into hospital with extreme nosebleed and was diagnosed with high blood pressure. By the end of the year, he was diagnosed with total renal failure. Fortunately, it was suitable for prenatal dialysis, and even this, involved liquid, even this involved liquid transfer treatment up to four times a day, and carrying around two litres of chemical fluid all of, all the time attached to his stomach. Not easy to say, but not to cope with rent on a day after day with no end in sight. The only escape was a kidney transplant. In October 2015, the prostate became available only to find it was not suitable. Again in 2016, another prospect, but no success, successful match. Deep clinical depression threatened, mitigated only by dedicated dedication of his family members. And at last, at the end of 2016, a successful match was attained, allowing life to get back to normal. So far, this kidney transplant has been successful, but there are signs of a viral infection, which is again slowly destroying the kidney. Once again, donors will need to be found. For my constituent and for the countless others in a similar situation, we are obliged to do all we can to maintain a good supply of organ don donors. Presiding officer, during 2017-18, more than 400 people across the UK died waiting for a transplant. We have the cl clinical skills and the expertise necessary, and we, must, uh, we just need to expand the pool of potential donors so that organs can be made available sooner. The public would, I think, support such moves, so let's move forward. Urgency is important, but so is getting this legislation right. It is with in mind that I look forward to the bill receiving further consider consideration in committee and returning to the Chamber for stage three in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Mason, for giving me some time back. You can have six minutes. Mr Brown is the last of the open debate speeches. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I was about to um, say I was likely to donate the half uh, minute of my time to the rest of the members, but I'm grateful for getting it back. Um, I think it's been a very good debate, even if it's been almost entirely um, consensual. 
I'm very grateful to the members of the Health and Sports Committee. I was on the committee for a short time, and I know from that time they went about their business uh, extremely diligently uh, through quite a number of uh, lengthy evidence sessions. I was also, like other members, very impressed by the specialist nurses, especially in one instance where they did a role play with family members going through the questionnaire. Uh, and that's obviously a very difficult time, but it was done extremely professionally, thoughtfully, and with kindness. I'd also thank the families of those whose relatives had donated. Um, they gave evidence and talked about the obviously very difficult circumstances. But even within that evidence session, there was some concern. I remember one family member who had said that um, when you hear the questionnaire that's gone through, she said she'd rather not have been part of that process. I can't remember, to be honest, whether she said she'd rather was an opt-out so she wasn't having to be put in that situation or the rights of the donors uh, were just evident and accepted. Um, there was one woman who preferred, as I say, not to have been part of that process and would have liked to have it taken out of her hands. And it is extremely intrusive. It's exhausting. Um, it happens at a very difficult time. Sometimes, as one member said, when the uh, family member is still alive and the, the members of the family are being questioned about this. And I wonder whether it's possible the process could have some further scrutiny, not least, uh, would it be possible, for example, to ask the potential donor at an earlier stage uh, some of these questions? Asking a son or a daughter or a mother about the sexual history of the relatives is a very difficult thing to do. And both that and whether it's possible through uh, more medical work being done in terms of tests, either on the person concerned at that point or at an earlier point, if we can find some way to reduce the intrusiveness of the questionnaire, I think that would be something that would help uh, donor figures. Um, other concerns, the soft opt-out, I think all, all members of the committee heard some instances of people who said that if there was to be a soft, soft opt-out, they as people who were currently registered would come off that register. They felt so strongly about what they felt was a diminution of their rights, the right that the state can go in uh, and take organs uh, from your body without you having taken any uh, action um, to prevent it. So there was that concern that's out there and that does worry me uh, somewhat. However, my main concern is the relative discount that we heard placed time and time again on the wishes of the donor, the central person in all this. We had instances where do people did not want to donate and they did donate. We had many instances where people wanted to donate and a family veto, and the family veto exists. Whatever has been said by some members here, we heard time and time again, I think some other members said 100 cases of family refusals. So somebody in full possession of their senses, knowing what they're doing, taking a legally competent decision to donate, is then frustrated subsequently by some people who might not even be very close family members for their reasons, and they may be understandable. And I think that should be a real concern uh, to all of us. And we can imagine the situation where somebody that might benefit from that donation, say waiting on a heart, and somebody who has in all conscience taken the decision they want to donate their heart and possibly other organs, and then it's frustrated by family members. Um, and uh, that person waiting on the heart doesn't get the heart. Uh, I think Kenny Gibson said every single one of these cases is absolutely crucial. If we can increase it by one, uh, then that will be a, a tremendous achievement. And it's also true to say we had a lot of evidence about the feelings and the wishes uh, of the medical staff. I think uh, the convener, and he's quite right, this was said, I don't agree with it, but it was said, that medical staff cannot be expected to proceed with a donation procedure when the families are expressly against that position, or words to that effect. I don't want to put words in the convener's mouth. Now, I, I don't agree with that. There are jurisdictions where the rights of the donor to donate are what is respected. And I think also, if the family members understand that well in advance, and I support all the work that's been suggested to make sure there's a campaign to make sure people are much more aware of this, then there shouldn't be that veto. It should be the case that that, that donor's uh, rights uh, are respected. And of course it's the case that the relatives, especially in that horrible set of circumstances, will have very strong feelings. But it's my view that the person who is, at least at that stage, in possession of these organs should have uh, the ultimate right. I think there are a number of things which I would be grateful if the committee could look at. I think I've highlighted uh, some of those and also maybe take some evidence from or, or look at some of the evidence from some of those jurisdictions where, do, where they do follow this path. There was also an issue, a brief issue about the age. Because I think what's been proposed in the bill is that from the age of 16, 16 and 17 year olds, which has no counterpart, I think, in England and Wales and some of the issues that that might throw up uh, in terms of uh, uh, 
donation. Obviously, organs can go across boundaries within the UK as well. Uh, and we haven't heard uh, much of that. So these are some of uh, my concerns, uh, presiding officer, and I just hope that they will be further listened to. I would ask that they, both the committee, uh, Health and Support Committee, who I think has done a tremendous job, uh, and the government will listen to some of these concerns uh, as the bill progresses. However, at this stage, uh, I do agree that the rights, uh, the intentions of the bill are good intentions. They do try to achieve what we all want to see, which is more viable organs going to more people that need them. And for that reason, as things stand and at this stage, I am willing to support the general principles of the bill. We now move to the closing speeches. Uh, David Stewart, six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think this has been a, an excellent uh, debate with well-informed and thoughtful contributions from across the Chamber. As we've heard from, I think, all members, of course, this is crucial legislation. How do we raise the level of organ donations in Scotland to match the needs of those desperately awaiting transplantation? And again, as we've heard from many speakers, tragically, 426 patients died in the UK whilst on the transplant list or within one year of removal last year. Again, we've heard uh, that Scotland has the highest percentage of people on the organ donation register in the UK, but the lowest actual organ donation in terms of rates per million. So the key issue, presiding officer, is the gap between those who wish to donate organs and the number who actually go on to join the organ donation register. Uh, around 80% support donation, but only 52% have signed up the donation register. So in simplistic terms, the purpose of the bill is to bridge the divide, to encourage those who support organ donation but haven't registered an ORD to have their wishes respected. Let me tell you about my, my friend Gary. He's in his mid-50s and he lives in Glenrothes in Fife. Nearly two years ago, he was given the gift of life by a crucially needed heart transplant. Prior to that, he was on the transplant list for 12 months and had a pacemaker, but he was slowly deteriorating and without the transplant, he would have died. I spoke to Gary at the weekend and he said he cannot praise enough the dedicated support of the medical and nursing staff at the Golden Jubilee. He said to me, it was a matter of life or death. So we know that international evidence and best practice are crucial elements in the principles underlying the bill. And we know from background research by the British Heart Foundation that people living in countries with soft opt-out were 17 to 29 percent more willing to donate their organs. So in general terms, soft opt-out means that unless the deceased has expressed a wish in life not to be an organ donor, consent will be assumed. And as we've heard from a number of speakers of the top 10 countries in terms of donors per million, nine have an opt-out system. This brings us to Spain, and I made a couple of interventions earlier on this. So Spain lead the World League table uh, for organ donations, and we took evidence at the Health and Sport Committee on this point. So why are they so successful? Well, there's three main reasons. They have a comprehensive network of transplant coordinators, they have a donor detection program, and they have greater provision of intensive care beds. But even if the UK refusal rate was reduced to similar levels with Spain, that's 40% to 15%, but the donation rate would still only be half of that which currently is enjoyed in Spain. So could the ministers wind up commenting on this? Bearing in mind, of course, this is not a zero-sum game, we must also be concentrating on increasing the number of intensive care beds to allow for the increased number of organ donation care. And of course, whilst Labour will support the bill, there are some issues which are worth uh, further discussion around adults with incapacity. We've heard from Keith Brown on that issue and the variable age of children to consent, 16 in Scotland and 18 in Wales, which is referred to uh, by many members. There are also some issues around rights and obligations of decision making and organisation in the bill. So as we've heard in simple terms, again, the three routes to decision are an opt in, an opt out, uh, or deemed authorisation, which is really a passive decision. But as the Minister will know, the Law Society and others have raised legal questions around this, which the Minister may wish to look at. Firstly, is deemed authorisation consistent with the Montgomery ruling, which was Montgomery versus NHS Lancashire, which was a Supreme Court case around informed consent? And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, and I'm sure the bill, the Minister has already had some information from his advisors on this, is the bill consistent with the European Convention 
on human rights, uh, specifically the case of Elbert versus Latvia of 2015. For those members that are not intimately familiar with the case, uh, Mrs. Elbert's husband tragically died in a car crash with no recorded wishes on organ donation. Uh, his tissues were used and the court later ruled this was a violation of Article 8 of the ECHR, um, which of course, as the Minister knows, the bill has to be consistent with ECHR before it can get approval from the presiding officer. So in practice, uh, in the future, what assessment has been made uh, that pro medical professionals will in fact take into account the wishes of the family irrespective of the terms of the bill? Should the law reflect this? And will transport uh, units, as I said, have capacity to deal with the increase in donations. Conscious of time, presiding officer. So in conclusion, uh, Labour supports the general principles of the bill. However, we've also highlighted areas where the bill can be strengthened. Uh, and I agree with uh, Andrew Tickler of Glasgow Un Caledonia University when he said, and I quote, the failure to put the rights of family members and duties of doctors on a statutory footing appears even more problematic. So I would strongly suggest that the Scottish Government look again at the question marks around the Bill's compliance with Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Notwithstanding the above, this is a vitally important piece of legislation which will improve Scotland's position in the International League of Organ Donation and will literally be a matter of life and death for many Scots, like my friend Gary, who was desperately in need of life-saving organ donation. Uh, as Carhail Gibran uh, once said, you give little when you give of your possessions. It's when you give of yourself that you truly give. Thank you. Ryan Whittle, seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. And I'm, I'm pleased to be, uh, have the opportunity to close uh, this debate on behalf of the Conservatives. And it's already been mentioned in here, it's been a very consensual debate, and that's hardly surprising, given that the topic is how do we... Uh, how we all want to uh, increase uh, organ donation and that. But there have been a number of things uh, uh, raised within that. And it's, again, uh, it's been ably demonstrated by some of the contributions uh, from across the chamber. This bill has uh, instigated much thought uh, and deliberation. Uh, the, the, uh, on the face of it, you might imagine that the bill should uh, be straightforward and it should pass uh, quite smoothly, as, as I've said, uh, after the aim of the bill is to increase Organ, uh, uh, organ and tissue donation uh, and it's one I think that most of us would uh, commend and as uh, Scottish Conservatives will be supporting uh, this bill at stage one. However, in supporting the bill, uh, I think we have to recognise the level of investigation undertaken and evidence taken by the Health and Support Committee and then the subsequent discussion uh, that this initiated in, the, in the, the committee and some of the things that have been thrown up and thrown up today in this chamber and I think to start with presenting officer I think my, my fellow committee members would agree with me that the, the evidence taken was as comprehensive uh, as it was uncomfortable to hear in some cases I think many, many many members have mentioned Miles Briggs, Alison Johnson, Alice Cole Hamilton have mentioned the, the specialist nurses and their staff and their demonstration of how they do their incredible work acting out that, that intervention and that role play and I think uh, none of us will fail to be moved in that particular uh, session and learning that, that, that there could be up to 300 questions uh, uh, asked of family members in those incredibly difficult circumstances when they have just lost, uh, lost a loved one. I think the Minister highlighted why it is so important to increase organ donation given that only about 1% of uh, uh, donors are, are, are actually uh, available um, in, the, in the way that they, uh, they actually meet their end. Maurice Corey reminded us that the people uh, on organ waiting lists actually do die while they're waiting uh, for organ donation. So it is an incredibly important bill. I wanted actually to, to um, mention Keith Brown and, and, and uh, in this one here because uh, in his time in Health and Sport Committee uh, and, and, and this particular bill, he was very exercised by the rights uh, of, of the, the organ do donors themselves and, and very consistent in that and again has brought it into the chamber today. And I think that um, on the face of it, uh, you know, I, I agree with Mr Brown that, that uh, if, you know, if you decide that you're going to donate your organs, your, your wishes should be the ones that are paramount. However, as, as Miles Briggs highlighted here, uh, uh, the wishes of the family uh, will be taken into account here uh, and healthcare professionals will not go against the wishes of the family. And in essence, because it's required that, uh, that, 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 that before uh, 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 organs can be donated, 
that these, this questionnaire is fulfilled by the family. If they do not want to, if they do not want to take part in that questionnaire, they supersede. Uh, they supersede the, the wishes of the individual. So it is a, it is a conundrum there, and I, and I do recognise uh, um, uh, Keith Brown's sort of campaign, if you like, here to, to highlight the, the, um, uh, the rights of the deceased. And how we get round that, uh, Mr. Brown, I think we'll, 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 continue, we'll continue to have that discussion. I think one of the things we can do is encourage that discussion among family members long before we get to that stage so that the wishes of the donor are understood uh, completely by the family. I think when um, Dave Stewart uh, first raised this, uh, the, this issue with Spain uh, and trying to, trying to do that comparison between Spain, Spain and Scotland, uh, I, think, I think we've got to be careful here because uh, we're not comparing apples with apples here because as quite rightly was said, they have a different system to us and they have intensive care beds in every hospital and, and therefore have a capacity that we currently don't have. So in conjunction with this bill, I think it's important that we do, we do have a look at the capacity we have within Scotland and can we take, how many more uh, donors can we particularly take in this? Um, so the, the, the idea of presumed consent being the, the, that silver bullet as everybody uh, talks about and uh, um, uh, uh, will not necessarily um, increase the organ donation uh, the way we would like it to do. I think there is a clear and significant difference between uh, actual consent and deemed consent. I think this is this exercise me uh, quite a lot in this, or, or perhaps even a stated opt out for that matter. My own personal view is that we should be ensuring that the opportunities to take a stated position be made widely available. Ensuring that that awareness is, uh, of the bill I think is crucial. And I was one of the 40% um, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer who would uh, uh, donate organs but hadn't. And it wasn't until I was in uh, the Health and Sport Committee that I was actually made aware that I was one of the 40%. And it was only because I happened to move house and had to change my driving licence that I got the opportunity to sign up. And it's very simple. It only took seconds and I was signed up. So I think that's something we need to be cognisant of. And I think we need to make sure that, that opportunity is available uh, as much as possible. I think I do want to mention at this point um, Mark Griffin's personal contribution to this debate uh, and to this cause and that of Anne McTaggart. I think both have been so influential in bringing this debate to the stage that it now is. Presiding officer, I believe that this bill in of itself will not necessarily lead to the increase of organ donation. I do believe, however, that the scrutiny of this bill by the Health and Support Committee and the subsequent awareness, while by, by its own very definition, potentially have individuals you know, create a, that environment where individuals can speak about this and consider uh, their own situation. Uh, is the Scottish Conservatives' view, therefore, that a, a continuing awareness campaign that encourages a clear decision for those 40% of the population yet to make their views clear is essential to go along with the bill? They do say that 50% of marketing works. They're just not sure which 50%. So if by bringing this bill forward, we raise awareness and we encourage those conversations and encourage taking a position ultimately leading to that increase in organ donation with all the lives that could possibly save, then I think this bill will be worth it. Now call on Joe Fitzpatrick. Uh, nine minutes or so will take us up to decision. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So I want to, to thank members um, for what has been, I think, a very interesting debate on what is a complex and sensitive subject. Um, there are obviously some different views on, on how we get to there, but I think everyone in the chamber is of the view that we want to in increase donations. And the evidence suggests that there is no one um, solution to increasing organ donations and tissue donations, but I'm sure that we all agree that it's important that we do what we can and, and take the initiatives, initiatives that we can to increase donations. Um, it's hoped over the long term, deemed authorisation will continue to change the culture towards support for organ and tissue donations. And um, I want at this point to put on record my thanks to the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, the Finance Committee, and in particular to the Health and Sports Committee for their work to inform the Parliament's consideration of this bill. And I'd probably add to others in, in thanking the many organisations that have provided briefings, which I, I think we all found, found helpful. Um, I'm going to use my time to try and pick up on as many of the issues that members have raised during the debate as time permits, and I'll follow up others in writing if I don't quite get there. Uh, but first, I want to 
um, to thank those members who raised personal experiences uh, today because I, I think that is, is always per particularly helpful. So, so Miles Briggs um, talking about Miley, um, Mark Griffin, a, a very um, moving speech about his father, um, Emma Harper talking about her experience as a nurse. Um, that, that is all important because I think for, for all of us it, it's important that we understand just what, why, why this bill is, is so important and what it means to so many people. So I think Lewis MacDonald talked about the, 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 the ongoing process of culture change and, and awareness raising around organ and tissue donation because I think that is so important in encouraging more people to support donation. Um, as I said, many members have already said as well that opt-out alone is not the answer to, to make the change. It has to be one measure of a package of measures that we are already having um, to make a real impact. Um, Maurice Corey and Emma Harper, and I think Brian Whittle just at the end there, um, I think talked about one of the very important points that I think will make a big difference. And it's about people making a decision, um, but then also discussing that decision with their family. I think that is so important. So I, I hope that the, the, the process of this bill uh, is, and I know for some members in the chamber, taken longer than they would have liked. Um, but hopefully the process of the bill has got more people talking about donation and talking to their family, because I think that will make the whole process easier. Before I touch on some of the, the points I need to respond to, I want to just recognise the, the point that Alec Cole Hamilton made, um, an important point in relation to living donors. Um, and if I can also echo the point that he and uh, Keith Brown and probably others made um, in praise of our specialist nurses who, along with others in, in the, um, the donation and transplantation community, do a fantastic uh, job. Moving on to the, the, the topics that were raised, um, a number of members, Miles Briggs, Alison Johnson, Keith Brown in particular, um, talked about the role of families. And families will remain critical to the process in communicating the views of the potential donor and providing information about them to ensure the safety of organs and tissues for transplantation. And families will also continue to perform an authorization role in certain circumstances. So any potential donor's families members would be fully involved in the process. Very quickly. David Stewart. I'm, I'm very grateful for the Minister giving way and could just reinforce that the Minister knows I support this legislation, but I do think there's real issues around the European Court um, of Human Rights, particularly Article 8, and I would stress again, in case he's forgotten, uh, the Latvia versus Elbert case is really relevant here, and I'm sure you've got the lawyers working in this test case. So, Joe Fitzpatrick. Yeah, th thanks very much. I, I do need to make process, progress, but that was one of the points I was going to, going to, to cover. So, um, um, we're, we're absolutely content that the, 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 the bill is compliant. The, the issue specifically in, in Latvia at, in relation to Elbert, the outcome of the Elbert case turned on its own particular facts and circumstances. The issues was the quality of the Latvian organ donation legislation, which gave fa family members a right to object to donation, but provided no mechanism for that right to be given um, effect too. So a very different set of processes. If we've learned anything from this, then it's about making clear that this bill is about the rights and the, and the views of the person who would be making the donation. So I think it is an important point, and it's an important point that we, we do learn lessons from others, but I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that the, the bill team have learned those, those lessons. Um, Keith Brown in particular um, spent some time talking about his, his concern um, of um, that in some cases there is a family veto in effect. Um, and again, to be clear, authorization is, is something that is, 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 is for the, the person who is making the donation. But we need, do need to remember that it is always a very difficult time for families when they've just lost a loved one. And the current system deals with these issues in a sensitive way, and this will continue under the new system. The principle, though, behind the proposed system, as with the current system, is to give effect to the donation decision that a person made in life. And so, but we also need to be mindful that donation happens in those distressing signal, uh, at a distressing time for families. And so it's right that clinicians are able to respond to that. Um, Sandra White talks about pre-death procedures and we've talked in committee at some point, but is there, was there a better word for these? But uh, of course, the whole part of the, 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 the our transplant system is we need to be transparent and, 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 and pre-death procedures does describe what, what these are about. So by including these 
um, provisions. The bill is not only setting out a framework for the carrying out of these procedures, which will be able to, to respond to change, but it's also bringing transparency to the whole of the donation process, letting people know what they are agreed to. And of course, we've made it very clear that if there's changes to those processes, then they will come back to this parliament um, to, to be approved by the affirmative process. And so I think that is, is, is also important. Um, a large number of members, Lewis McDonald, Alison Johnson, Emma Harper, Kenneth Gibson, and I'm sure others um, talked about the, the need, and the committee um, talked about the need for awareness raising, and the government is very clear that that is a very important part of taking this forward. It's essential for a soft opt-out system to work. And as set out in the consultation, it's the intention to have a high profile awareness raising campaign over at least 12 months before the introduction of the new system and on a regular basis after implementation to maintain awareness. It's crucial. It's a crucial part of the safeguards which will underpin the system aimed at ensuring people won't become donors if that isn't what they want or become donors if that is what they do want. Um, and specifically, we'll work with um, a range of groups, including disability groups, faith groups, to research, develop and test clear and accessible information, which will always be available in a range of languages. Alex Cole Hamilton um, talked about support for families. I think that is a very important point that he's raised. NHS National Services Division is currently reviewing the provision of psychological support across all of our nationally commissioned specialist services, including organ transplantation, to ensure, to ensure appropriate provision is in place. And the Scottish Government understands that the review will be completed later this year. Apologies, I, I have to make progress to, to respect other members who've taken part in the debate. Um, Miles Briggs and David Stewart uh, talked about infrastructure and the, the 2008 UK Organ Donation Task Force report considered the introduction of an opt-out system but prioritised improvements in infrastructure as it was considered that those who would have the greatest impact on donation at that time. And throughout the task force and the subsequent Scottish plan, we've seen significant developments around the donation and transplantation um, infrastructure over those decades. Um, but I do recognise, um, and I recognise in my response to the committee, that this is an, an, there is an ongoing commitment to supporting measures, including infrastructure, to increase donation. Moving to the point raised by uh, Mr Rumbles in particular, I think Maurice Corey also, we are satisfied that the wording in the bill is not overly burdensome, but um, I would be happy to discuss that more um, with the, the, the member, just to make sure I'm understanding him fully and hopefully um, I will be able, along with officials, to um, allay his concerns. But I, I think I'll, I'm offering a, a serious discussion to, 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 to make sure we can understand what the bill is actually trying to do and trying to, to say the, the approach in the bill is broadly similar to that that is in the Welsh legislation, and we're not aware of, of the issues that the member is concerned about. Our specialist nurses are, as we've heard, highly skilled at having these conversations and families with families and provisions largely mirror the current practice around the conversations explored, exploring with family members what their loved ones' views are. Um, obviously, taking that forward, there would be guidance produced by NHS BT and SNBTS, but I'd be very clean, keen to have that discussion um, um, with, with the member. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would like to acknowledge um, again, and thank the Scottish Donation and Transplant Group, which advises the government on donation and transplantation matters for their assistance in developing this, yeah, the, this bill. I want to again to pay tribute to everyone who's uh, co uh, contributed in, in the debate today and everyone who has donated in the past uh, and every family who has supported those donations. Through such selfless acts, lives are saved and improved. I do hope that this bill will lead to further increases in donation to save further lives and I want to offer any such um, um, progress as a tribute to all those who have donated in the past. Members have um, raised several issues during the debate. If, if members feel, I will respond to those who have not managed to cover in writing. If other members feel that they, they want to discuss their particular issue to make sure that we have the most robust um, bill going, going through stage two and into stage three, then I would be very much uh, happy to do that. But again, thanks very much to all colleagues for taking part in what I think is a very, very important debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes this afternoon's debate.
Uh, the next item of business, business is consideration of motion 15594 on the financial resolution for the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill. And could I call on Derek Mackay to move the motion? Moved. Thank you very much. And we're going to turn straight to decision time. The first question is that motion 16001 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16001 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 107, uh, no, 1. There were two abstentions and the motion is therefore agreed. The final question is the motion 15594 in the name of Derek Mackay on Human Tissue Authorisation Scotland Bill financial resolution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on now to members' business in the name of Jenny Gilruth on LGBT History Month. But we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats. We'll just take a few moments to change seats.